be careful about who you piss off because some of us are still burned and now we'll never stop in that kind of a way, right? Hello, Architect Nation. I'm Enix Sears, and this is the show where you'll discover tips, strategies, and secrets for running a more impactful and profitable architectural practice. If you've ever been frustrated that you can't find the product data that you're looking for, you might be using the wrong search engine. Broad searches result in consumer products, out-of-date information, and websites that oftentimes may hide or not have the information that you need at your fingertips. If you need specifications, CAD, BIM, etc., RCAT.com is your search engine. Find and download the up-to-date product data you need fast. RCAT.com is free, requires no registration, so go ahead and try it today. That's RCAT, A-R-C-A-T dot com. My guest today is Lance Psycho. He's the co-founder of F9 Productions. We've had him here on the show before. You may recognize him from the popular Inside the Firm podcast. Today, we're going to talk about dealing with the grind in architecture. So without further ado, here is today's show. Lance, how you doing? Doing great. Thanks for having me, Nick. Absolutely. So Lance is a principal, uh, founder, co-founder of F9 Productions. You may know him from the illustrious podcast Inside the Firm, plus some of their other media media activities they have out there. And you know, Lance and I have been buddies, friends for a long time. Recently, Lance put something out on social media, as he frequently does. Um, by the way, if you're a fisherman, I definitely go check out Fishing with Lance, which is Lance's side, side op, his little side op. A freaking awesome catching like these huge pulling out these huge trout from this frozen lake and stuff. I'm like, man, I go to the ocean. I don't catch fish that big. <laughs> so, but today we're here to talk about a topic that he posted recently on social media, which was he said that he gets up and he grinds, and then now he gets up and he still grinds. It was referring to, what were you referring to there? Lance, what was that post all about? It was just a short little quote you posted. Yeah, well, I recently won the – I was nominated for most influential business leader in, in northern Colorado. There was five different categories. I'm obviously in the you know construction – the AEC category, architecture, engineering, construction. And uh, I ended up winning it, which was kind of blew my mind. Um, and so it was huge because uh, 15 years ago I was laid off from um, – a firm down here in Boulder, Colorado, to know that what it took to get there to win that kind of award, and after after sort of being down in the dumps, that's that's where it comes into the grind uh, of the whole thing. And so for me, it was a lot of waking up at 4:30, waking up at 5:30 every single, almost every single day, and grinding, trying to be ahead of the game going out of the box in terms of the ways that we would go out and try to get our first clients, uh, go above and beyond for our first clients and, and, and all those sort of things. So that's, that's where the post, that's where it came from. Cause I, I ended up putting in, uh, you know, and I, I basically said in the post and like the sub thread of it that, uh, and you know how I did it, or do you know how I do, you know, you know how this happened. And it was because I, I got up and I grind, I grinded every single day, almost every single day, you know? So uh, that's, that's what it takes. I think this is the, that's the missing part of what people maybe do or don't understand about entrepreneurs who end up being successful. There's a lot of entrepreneurs that are, you can, sure, you're an entrepreneur. If you, I mean, maybe you've started up 15 businesses, but none of them have ever taken off. They never got out of that seven year startup incubation period and flourished into something good. You're still an entrepreneur, but then the ones who actually make it work, like the Elon Musks of the world, who have whatever company they start, you know, it's almost successful. But what they're not seeing, and only some people know, I think like Elon fanboys like me and Al know that, well, this guy's sleeping like four hours a day, two, three hours a day. He's just constantly grinding. He never stops. Even if he's walking around, like I do this all the time, I, uh, if I'm hiking up to the, some of these fishing adventures and stuff like that, you know, is I'm... I have my notepad in my phone. Sure, I don't have any service, but I'm usually either like listening to a book or I am thinking and dictating to my phone about a business idea or other things that come to me because an entrepreneur just never stops. If we do stop, I think then we get actually, that's actually when we get the anxiety and we get uncomfortable. It, there's just something in us that feels like we have to we have to continually – we're never stopping. We know that we have to continually improve, and we know that there's people that depend on us too in a big way. I mean if me and Al aren't out there selling and we aren't bringing work in and helping the firm expand, then how can we continue to keep people employed, give them raises, 
all that stuff. You know, it's a delicate balance. What you just mentioned about if we're not doing business development, then so there's one of my mentors once told me, he said, every day I wake up and every day I'm a little bit stressed and worried about where the next project's going to come from. And he's like, and that's, I, he, he mentioned that that's healthy for him. In other words, like I'm every single day, I'm thinking about where's the next project coming from? Where's the next money income stream coming from? Who am I going to sell next? He, he's taken on the identity of, there's two things we talk about in smart practice, which is uh, becoming a number one, becoming a rainmaker. But beneath becoming a rainmaker, of course, for those of you who aren't in the U.S., rainmaker basically means you're an income producer. You're someone that makes it rain. You bring in the business. So a rainmaker in a business is the guy that brings in the clients, brings in the contracts, brings in the money. Without that, there is no, there's no business. So below that, Lance, we talk about two subcategories of kind of being or person. You need to be a closer and a marketer or another, flip that around, a marketer and a closer. Yeah. Say, say it again. Do I, I need to be both? Is that what, that was the yep, question? Yep. 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 You need to be both. So you, when you're waking up in the morning, like in those early days, you realize yeah. maybe you didn't think about it this way, but you're like, I need a market and I need a close. I need to get myself out there, get visible in front of people, and then I need to turn those relationships into work, into commitments. Oh, one hundred percent. Yeah, it's. I mean, yeah. the 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 synthesis word with that is, I think it's like you're prospecting. Uh, yeah. So, like that's the way I think about it, and and this is also uh, sort of a driving and then walking around in the city where there is service type of thing. So a lot of times when I'm going back and forth between either teaching at CU Boulder or North Dakota State or going in between sales meetings or something like that, I sort of have this working Rolodex in my head about people I should be calling, I should be getting on the phone with, I should be touching base with, I should ask them if they have any questions about our proposal, if they'd like, to, uh, if they're ready to move forward, is there any way I can help do that? Um, and then, uh, and then it, that's kind of coupled with like, there's a book I've, I read recently that I, I recommend every entrepreneur reads because it has everything to do with marketing. It's called Brain Glue. I thought it was one of the best books I've read about how to do taglines or advertising uh, since maybe like Made to Stick. I'd say Made to Stick would be like a companion book to that one um, because the brain glue is like it gets you in a silly mood. Um, so I, I listened to that one. So it's this constant juggle of, of exactly what you said is like I get up and I still feel that hunger. And I think that's a big part of it. It's why when people say when I go do other shows and guests on those, they'll ask me, what is, you know, maybe one piece of advice you would give any entrepreneur or somebody that's thinking about doing it, um, jumping off and, and starting their own businesses. I'm like, there's no better time to start a business than maybe a great depression or a great recession. If like, you just got to jump, it's actually probably, I think it's detrimental if you're starting in like a boom for sure, because you don't have that kind of same kind of hunger. You don't, you don't, you're not forced to be lean in that kind of way. And you just don't have that mindset. That's seared into you at that point, uh, where you're, where you're, when you need to do that. So that's what I like to do. Like, uh, I have a friend who recently finally started her own business and, she one of the things I was super proud about her was she, is she as soon as as soon as she finally got the right things in place to be able to be able to start it, which was basically she needed a sales funnel. And once she kind of identified that sales funnel, she just said, oh, I'm I'm firing all my cleaning clients like today. And I go, OK, <laughs> and then so she was instantly hungry and then was like this sort of piece of coal, right, that's pushed with all the pressure. And then that's how the diamonds are made. I love that analogy, like the diamonds. It's such a great analogy. And yeah, we can see, it's, we can see this with companies and uh, companies that have been successful. Some of, the, some of the best and strongest companies have started in adversity. One, one thing that I've always been a study of or uh, really a student of, like you, first of all, I'm resonating a lot with what you're saying, Lance, is like, I mean, I, I wonder, I've never actually heard another person say this to me, reflect this back, that they're always listening to something, but like, same thing with me, dude. When I'm going on my run, when I'm at the gym, if there's the latest podcast I'm listening to, if there's the latest book, if there's the latest seminar, I, I, I invest in coaching groups. So I'll go back and listen to the group calls of those coaching groups. I'm like always feeding the fertile, the fertile yeah. substance of my mind, you know, constantly, constantly thinking about improvement and growing and growing and keeping on improving. You're right. When, when things come easy to us, we get soft. We get soft. You know, when there's when there's low competition, when I look back to my athletic career, anything that I've done in life, when there wasn't competition, I didn't rise as high. And so this is one of the it's one of the frustrating things, but it's also one of the truths 
about business or excellence in every area is that the harder it is, the more you're going to grow. 100%. Yeah. And, I'm, and now I'm trying to get my staff to understand that because mm. we're hitting a, we're in a growth period right now. Uh, the, we, we, we've invested quite a bit of money um, with a pretty high end marketing agency in, over the last 14, 15 months. Same PR firm that uh, does Tucker Carlson's stuff, like pretty big deal. And for us, it was a just a giant financial investment, time investment, all that. But we're seeing us move up so high in the rankings now for if you just search for like Colorado architect or residential architect and stuff. And we've had the best. This isn't even a brag. This is just kind of me explaining what's going on is like in the last two months at the beginning of this year, it's the first time – it's 2024. It's the first time I've ever – we've ever had this many sales inquiries and just inquiries and interest that this at the beginning of the business cycle. So I'm like astounded but at the same time going, okay, I, I'm having to sort of refocus and recoach my upper-level staff who are managing people and starting to manage even more people that I understand that – you feel like we don't have enough time to work on these projects. And I, I'm, I might have to ask you to work a little bit more, which is not usual for us, but I promise you it's temporary. It's a temporary pain until we can hire new graduates. Like it's a very strange, weird area we're in right now in like the middle of March. New people graduate in May. Great. I, then I can bring them in and we have more horsepower and everything. But I can't think of uh, – and the, the same thing on the construction side of things because we're also general contractors is like the demand for us – is so high right now that I, I I'm trying to explain to my superintendent that he wants everything to sort of be just like we have a cut and dry system about how this how all this works when it comes to uh, taking on a new project and be in leadership positions and then replacing that lower level carpenter formerly lower level carpenter with another carpenter and stuff is that there's no perfect time for when this happens ever. I just I, – I've, I've doing this for 15 years now in the architecture side of things, business-wise, as an entrepreneur, I've just never seen a perfect growth pattern. It's like, oh, gosh, now we have too much work. Okay, we have to figure out how to get it done or or we have too little work and then I need to figure out how to get the, get the, get more work. It's ne There's never just this like perfect steady flow with no deadlines and all the other things. And, and so I understand that that growth pattern and the trajectory and the strain, right? It's just like lifting weights. I'm happy now. Oh, I need to lift more weights. So, okay, I got to get stronger. It's going to take more work. It's going to take more reps. It's going to take more eating, eating better, all, all that kind of stuff. And that I understand that, but now I'm my, our, our sort of me and Alex's struggle is like, Oh crap, we have to get staff to understand this. Like, how do we, how do you explain that to staff and, you know, and try to promise them and caress them and, and soothe them through that whole process. Uh, it's interesting. I mean, I just finished um, Patrick McLeamy's HOK book, the uh, uh, what the heck is it? How to design a world class firm, and what a, what an inside, what a beautiful inside look. I was going to have him on the show on our show in a couple weeks again, second time he'll be on there, and I've got questions for him lined up uh, myself because I'm just like, what a beautiful inside look at one of the world's biggest architecture firms ever, and it was so reassuring to he hear some of the things that they were talking about as like a somebody who has a small firm, you know, only only like 11 people compared to those guys of 1100. And uh, there were some things that I that they stated where I was like, "Oh, cool. We we were already doing that. Wow, I can't believe HOK wasn't doing that for the first 20 years. That that's reassuring." And then there were other things where like, "Oh, shoot. We need to do that. I hadn't even thought of that." What a, what a good uh, what a good example of of what we should and shouldn't be doing in that kind of way. So it's I I think comparisons the thief of joy but definitely there's got to, you got to have some kind of comparison just to see if maybe you're doing things if it's okay if the, some of the things you're doing because business is experimentation I was asking Al this the other day is like how much of business do you think how, as I, how much do you think we're experimenting like on a percentage basis you know with a new marketing idea or uh, or for instance I had this other client who came in the other day and they they said we need this done in you know X amount of time and I go well there's here's the fee for that X and they go or for the reality X and they go nope I need X and I go and I asked when I told one of my other uh, one of my senior architects here I was like do you want to do you want to have some fun he's like what do you mean I'm like let's business if we're, if we're not having fun either this is business sucks like it's half this should it should be fun every day it should be fun he's like I was like 
let's see if they're open to us doubling our fees and having our time. He's like, no way. I'm like, come on. Come on, dude. Let's try it. I was like, do you, I was like, we don't technically need need the work, do we? And he goes, no. And I go, well, but what if we double our fees in half the time? And he went through the experiment with me. It was actually quite a, quite a bit of negotiation, um, but it was super fun. And then they went for it and everything. And we got done with the exercise. <laughs> nice. And I go, thanks for trusting me. I'm giving you a raise when I get back in a promotion. And, and I did, actually. I gave him a... I gave him well, one of the highest salaries that we've that we've given out so far in our 15 years or something like that, and then it also helped me gain his trust a little bit more, even more with like business experimentation like that. So I'm digressing here, but I get really ex- I uh, that's one of the best parts I think is like the little experiments and all the experiences and it, 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 and uh, it ceases to amaze me too. Like dealing with the general public, some people, I mean, yes, it's difficult, but at the same time, it's like, oh my gosh, I feel like I'm gonna experience. Like I don't know how many you perfectly unique. If you could, you could argue there's unique people. Like every single person is unique. Like God made ever perfectly unique. But at the same time, like that we're sort of categorical. And I feel like if I keep doing this long enough, I'm gonna hit every category of every person, personality type. <laughs> Probably so. Yeah. You, you know, it's business is not a straight line, yeah. and that's one of the fun, that's one of the most fun things about it, which is that it's there's always variety happening. You can never tell what's going to happen. You can guess that you're going to hire this person, they're going to work out, but you don't know what's going to happen in three months, right? You might have a project get canceled or something like that. So Mm -hmm. there is this element of being a leader where the uncertainty, I had a really good friend of mine, he told me something once that really I thought was quite profound. Guy pulls in seven figures a year, so successful businessman. And he said, Enoch, here's the thing. He said, I make sure, because we were talking about the need for certainty, which is kind of kind of the underlying thing that you're referencing here, that sometimes in business we want certainty. We want it to be a straight line. We want it to be smooth sailing. We want it to be like, when are the deadlines going to finally get easy? When, when am I going to have a match between how much capacity we have and how much work we're bringing? And when is it just going to be, you know? Or here's right? one recently. Yep. When am I finally going to be able to command the fees that I know we deserve for this certain typology that we've proven ourselves to be experts in in Colorado? And I'm like... Come on, at some point. <laughs> yeah, like we're getting referred go. for this perfect typology. And it's like, stop balking at the fees. This is what it takes. Well, and that's another good point. Like, is there ever going to be a client who doesn't balk at the fees? Let's face it, sometimes there are, right? Mm-hmm. But this is another thing. Like with sales and with negotiation, a lot of times we go into this thinking that there's one single answer, that there's a perfect match between the price we can charge and the price the person's going to pay. When in reality, there's no such thing. It's always a negotiation. Right, so if you have someone who accepts your fee right off the bat, you probably didn't charge enough. Yeah, like if, yeah, uh, if, if they if they don't if they don't like look a little dismayed if they don't kind of push back on your fee, then you left money on the table. I think so too. I think that's generally true. Yeah, and you got to be prepared to defend it. I mean, it even comes down to invoices. There's invoices, you know, because we do like general contracting, we're open book. So the so what we end up invoicing can change. Because we just explained that, look, there's conditions on the site that sometimes we can't predict. You know, we open up the, we start excavating and we find a big rock or, or, you know, something like that in that kind of way. So it's sort of a bookending of the whole negotiation, depending on how your business operates. Uh, But yeah, I agree with you. There's got to be some pushback. It should, I think Tyler Suomala was telling me the other day uh, on LinkedIn, or we were chatting about that, or just reading something he wrote, I think, on his post about if your if your fee doesn't make you even just a little bit uncomfortable and it's kind of relates back to the growth part of it right it's like yeah i mean you should be looking at your fees every year like am i charging enough should i be charging more there's inflation we've gained more experience so we bring more value to the table and so if you're not again experimenting and, and pushing on the edge from time to time then i don't think you're doing the right thing you can't get stagnant and how do you how do you guys determine what is like how you set your fees? Like do you work oh, backwards a from a from a goal that you have at a certain po- profit percentage you want to run in the business or how do you guys do it? Yeah, 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 there's definitely that. It it's a, it's a it's a complicated equation which sucks because it's like should it be should it be simple or should it not be? And I'm not sure I'm not sure it ever can be simple for maybe a service-based business like us, architect or builder. Um, so definitely we have a goal. We always, Alex and I are trying to strive for between 25 and 30%, uh, minimum for a profit for an architecture firm. And the, the, the statistics on it vary. You, you probably have one in your head too, where it's like, I think the average 
Some people say it's 13. Some people say 15%. Oh, but it's geez. definitely under 20% is the, is, is the oh, average yeah, yeah, for yeah. sure. And you take yeah. out the large firms. Small firms, it's more like 8. And even that's micro a, firms, that's insane. zero. Those are insane razor-thin profits. That's like a restaurant, yeah. right? And the restaurants yeah. freak me out. Like those are – if that's true, Enoch, which I believe it is in terms of the small firms being on that thin of a margin, I used to say restaurateurs had the biggest cojones out of any entrepreneur on the planet because they have such razor thin margins. But if if the architects are doing the same crap, then I guess maybe they're tied with them in that kind of way. That's not that's not good, though. I think we're, we should all be striving for that. So, yes, we start with that sort of in mind. And then it's like, okay, how do we start – if our goal is 25 to 30 percent or 30 percent plus. I was Two years ago, we hit 30 percent plus. We are super happy about it. We are – I mean that is the North Star. The North Star is like stay 30 percent plus. It's like, okay, then how do, you, how do you start to think about if I can get there? And I think you can examine some hourly rates. That's a pretty easy one. So you go, okay, let's say my senior staff, they're, they're, they cost me this much per hour. You break the whole thing down. And then you go, okay, what are we charging per hour if, if we're doing any kind of hourly stuff? And then and then there's another matrix where you're going, all right, so if X amount of like let's say a house costs, you know, one million dollars, and then what are what is the average firm charging uh, percentage wise of the construction budget? And you can start to examine that number and then kind of do some reverse math from there. There's there's that way of doing it. Uh, we'll also we basically are examining the fees. I think from like three or four different perspectives. And like so, another perspective is we'll have a spreadsheet up and we'll just calculate. Okay, how many how much actual time do we think this is going to take to do it? And then multiply that final number by a percentage for the, for the profit. And maybe just like oh a pad week. It's going to take an extra week or month or something to do this project. And then we're constantly looking at the books. Um, that's probably the fourth metric for the whole thing. So in real time, at the end of every month, we have our bookkeeper uh, do a, a financial health sort of audit on it. And I forget the acronym that Al was saying, a KPI. So we do a KPI uh, spreadsheet. So we understand what our key performance indicators are in that kind of way. And I will say that to everybody listening to this and going, oh my gosh, that's like, oh my, that's like, how am I going to do this as a startup? We didn't do it as a startup. Like we're out of the startup phase. I got to be clear about that. We, you're technically supposed to be out of the startup phase about year seven. And I think that is kind of when we started to grow up too and start getting those kind of key performance indicators in and metrics in there and really starting to look at them in that way. So I think it's, it's totally okay for those first five to seven years to just kind of fly by the seat of your pants you have a good system and framework in for sure, but you don't really have to have it all figured out right away. You're just trying to survive in those first five to seven years, right? And if you're doing the fundamental things of getting up every day before the, before the sun gets up, doing the grind, you know, grinding, trying to stay ahead of people, constantly learning, like we talked about with the books or the business coaching and all that kind of good stuff. When you get to, when you get to where we're at finally now, I would say, you know, past year seven, then you need to start looking at the fees in like three or four different ways and deciding where it should be. And then then ultimately, it's sort of the fifth way, which is completely out of our control, is, okay, we put together the proposal, we send it out there into the public realm. And then the market's going to tell us if, if it's going to bear our fees or not. It's as simple as that. Like, it is mostly still a free enterprise in America. So that's who's going to tell us if we're too high or too low or all the good stuff. I just got off the phone with uh, my civil engineer, and he and I were just talking about this. And I was, he was like, I was like, how much time, how much more time do you think our, our, uh, multiplier, like if you had to multiply your feet, what do you think our fee is? He goes, oh, usually four to five, isn't it? And I go, not really. It all kind of depends. And then we started just kind of sh talking shop about the whole thing. And he was like, yeah, we're kind of in the mix right now of if we're competing against the really big firms, he said, and we, our fees are too low, then they're not high, like they're not high enough and they won't take us seriously. And he goes, and at the same time, I'm also competing with like the tire, the bottom of the barrel civil engineers in Colorado, just like one or two man shops who can, you know, come at, like their overhead's very low, so they can come in lower. Just how it works, right? Scale of economies. And he goes, we'll bid on those projects and then we're way too high. He goes, so I can't, he goes, it's just a tricky equation. And and that's I do I do think Al and I and F9 are sort of in that category in certain categories where it's like, yep, we're going against the big guys. 
and then maybe we came in too low and they, you honestly look like too cheap or something like that. There's something about it. And then if we're going against the bottom of the barrel, people, same thing. We're too expensive. So for us, if but, you, but then again, it's kind of sort of the, is there a perfect linear way for this? Nope. I can't pick. Like I can't just wave my hand and trust me, we, were, we market to everybody, super high end people, lower middle class, whatever. You got to, I mean, you got to understand human psychology as well. Right. And I know, I know you become a student of human psychology, right? It's, it's not, it's not a straight line, you know? Mm -hmm. Now, one, one thing I would say for our listeners is, uh, Lance, I've always been, I think tracking is important, even for startups, like when they're first starting out, you don't need to have the full range of KPIs. Yeah. But imagine you guys did have your pulse on your pipeline. Imagine you guys did have some numbers that targets you were trying to hit instead of just getting out there and being crazy psychos in the, uh, in the marketplace. Yeah, definitely. We had QuickBooks in place. I will say that. We had a system for invoicing. We had a system for receiving. And that's probably the ba the book, easiest, quickest way you can start. It doesn't matter. Maybe FreshBooks is the same thing, whatever kind of online software. For us, it was QuickBooks. And QuickBooks does a really good job of it. Like, it'll help you try to predict your cash flow. It, the, the metrics are right there. You can have the, I have the mobile app. And I'm, I'm looking at the mobile app probably once a day, honestly, uh, even if it's after work or you know, at a stoplight or something like that, and, and just seeing where we're at with billables, if there's overdue invoices and that kind of thing, and then you're tracking your cash flow in that way. So for sure, at a very basic level, we, we, we've tracked from pretty much day one, and then you start to layer in the extra stuff like you're talking about. And then eventually you start talking about kind of what you and I were talking about before we even started recording about buying other businesses, growing in that kind of way. And then you start, then there's other acronyms that get thrown out like EBITDA, Right, earnings before income taxes, and I forget what it, amortization or something, um, which helps. It's that's only one metric of valuing a business, and then there's another one from the HOK book where it was like, oh, how do you value? How do you figure out the value of your, each share you have in your company? And that's a metric for it, right? And then then who was ever buying it could have a totally different metric where they're factoring in. Let's say you're trying to buy a firm that has a ton of government work, and they have contracts for like five years. That's a different equation, too, that's layered into it for sure. So I feel like it's just never – I love that. I actually love that it never stops. Um, that's one of the few things I think I'm okay with, like, continually learning on. I, I am sick of taking, like, tests. No more architecture tests. No more contractor tests. But I'm happy to kind of learn on my own in that with this ever-growing, like, acronyms that come up. I want to point out something for our listeners here that uh... – if they're listening closer to what you're saying, there's there's something very cool here that's that's very apparent, which is and I'm just gonna put this out here and see how it lands for you, Lance. Lance is not an architect doing business. Lance is a businessman. Now he may be an architect as well, but obviously he's also a businessman. So, you know, architects, so to all the architects listening today, there's there's something, there's something critical that needs to happen. There's a switch that needs to happen in your brain. To, be get, to get out of the constant overwhelm, to get out of the hamster wheel, to start to get yourself. Now, there's always going to be a bit of grind, but there can be balance in the business. There can be taking times off to go to the ball games. There can be earning awesome amounts of money, but it's going to be very difficult if you see yourself as an architect doing business. Because an architect doing business, when he's driving around, he's not thinking about the, the lunch meetings he needs to set up to do business development. He's not thinking about, he's not pulling up his, his phone and looking at the app to see QuickBooks and see where are we at with our numbers. So it's different. There's a very, there's a very important distinction here of being something versus doing something. And like, I saw this play out recently when I started jujitsu. So I started jujitsu about a year ago. When I first started doing it, I was like, I was a guy trying to do jujitsu. I was sitting there, I was like getting, getting choked out and just feeling awkward and not knowing the moves. Now when I go, I'm not thinking about what I'm doing anymore. It's just natural. I get on the mat. I know where to grab your collar. I know if I'm going to go down and pull you to the mat, maybe you're going to pull me to the mat. Maybe you're going to try to yank me down, but I, I kind of know, and I know how to modify myself because I'm now, I'm being that thing. It's, it's like, it's, it's ingrained in my habits. And when you finally get, if you're always trying to hold on to your identity as an architect and saying, I don't want to be a business person, I don't want to be a business person, from my experience, it's going to be a very, very long, painful you know what tweak I, You know what tweak I like to add to that? Yeah, So it please. completely resonates, obviously. Yeah. The what the tweak I like to add to that for any architects who, who, who like, I'm, I'm with you. I, I, I get off on design all the time. Trust me. I, I've, I love, I am... Especially now, since I went back into uh, teaching at North Dakota State, and in, in my second semester up there, 
teaching juniors and seniors architectural design. It's it's a hundred percent reinvigorated in me the fire and the passion for like beautiful architecture and I mean like the best right. So I found myself in the last uh, month or so, last couple months, um, just nerding out on and and buying way too many architecture books like like big fat ones like the three hundred fifty dollar set of uh, Norman Foster um, stuff like that. Looking at watch, watching as many documentaries as I can find on as Amazon Prime and stuff like that. I'm with you guys. The high high design stuff, trust me, I, I I love it. I'm sitting in the building I designed and built and for myself and Alex and all that, and it's postmodern and one of the most modern buildings in our the town we operate in. And everybody, all of our potential clients and people that walk into it, they're just they love it. They want something similar, it, you know, all that good stuff. And uh, designed and built two of my own houses, um, and they're both award winning. Have won multiple international architecture awards and stuff like that. I was watching the Philip Johnson uh, documentary the other day, and he has a – in Connecticut, he's got this big estate, right? And one of the things he said on that – in that documentary was he says – he goes, the best clients – the best clients are is is you. Like you're the best client, the architect, right? And I, I loved how uh, – like it was – that's a very ivory tower sort of – yes, okay, general public clients, you're you're not – you're not actually the best client if I could ever design and build for myself. And I know that for a fact, it totally resonated with me. And it was it, because I was like, yeah, I am the best client for myself. Like, duh. Like I it was so, it was obvious, like designing my own house, designing my own building. I could make quick decisions. Um, I was still conscious of the budget and that sort of thing. Or I was okay with like spending a little bit more money on and trusting myself or trusting Al and knowing that, like, no, no, we're not skimping on, you know, you can see behind me here, like, the light coming through in that big glass garage door. Like, we're not putting up an opaque one. We'll spend the extra five grand it takes to do it. Like, that's a big deal. It's going to make a big deal and pay off in the long run with showcasing the building and everything. What I'm getting at is, if you can be a business person first and the architect and the architect second and embodied in that, well, then just make enough money and crush it business-wise so you can commission your own work like Philip Johnson did. And all of these architects who, who do that, like that is, I mean, then there's like Norman Foster, his his penthouse and his studio, right, on the, on the riverfront there, like that's a beautiful, beautiful building. And he, he, it's, even the space is laid out. Like if you go look at the floor plans, the way he thinks about space so clearly about the public side and the private side, and the private side also being connected with the mechanical and all of that, I'm like, well, it was, it was so good because he didn't even have to, it was no committee. It was just him designing it for himself. So you can do you can do both of those things. You can be an, a great business person who is making 30% profit, putting money away, and leapfrog yourself into the kind of work that gets your design goat. Maybe maybe it is as simple as starting with your house, starting with an ADU in the back of your property, and then eventually taking a leap like we did, where you buy land and become an actual real estate developer. Jonathan Segal, San Diego, perfect example. Perfect. That's probably the, actually the best contemporary example of. Getting his design goat, he's a fellow in the AIA, um, super famous, super wealthy, buys all these awesome cars. He's he's a killer. He's crushing it. He's like the yeah. architectural playboy. We just yeah, like. he is, dude. Oh, his geez. scotch and his cigar. Yeah, I love <laughs> I it. Know. He's, he's great. He's great. Yeah. Hey, with the remaining minutes here, Lance, I want to talk about, um, and I'm going to define this power, right? Power. I want to talk about power. I'm not, I'm, but I'm going to define what power means. So I'm telling a quick story. So yesterday, um. I was hanging out with my son. My son is 16 years old right now, and he came home from school, and we have, he, he's homeschooled, but he's at like this charter school where he goes, some days he goes to a campus with other kids, other days he's at home doing his work on his own. And he comes home from school yesterday, and he's just so excited. Like, I've never seen him. He's kind of an introverted, kind of quiet kid. He's always kind of gloomy. He's like, kind of has a chip on his shoulder about the world, that kind of energy, you know? Anyways, he comes home. He's like effervescent. He's joyful. He's happy. He's he's like engaging with me in conversation. And I'm just like, this energy is just like exuding off of him. But I'm like, wow. And he said, Dad, let me tell you what happened at school today. I'm like, what happened at school today? And he said that he asked this girl to the dance, and she said yes. Right, this really cute girl that he likes, and he's like all excited about it. And so I took him out. We had some. We had I call it bro excursion or a man excursion. I took him out on a man excursion, which is like me and my son connecting. We kind of talked about it, and I pointed out to him. I said, "Hey, Zion is his name." I said, "Zion, how do you feel right now? Like, how do you like inside feel?" He's like, "Oh, I'm really happy." And I said, "Do you notice when you feel that way that you feel you're more inclined to do things? 
you're more inclined to be more confident. You're more inclined to take risks that you wouldn't take. You're more inclined to engage people in conversation. You're more, you're just more powerful, in other words. And like, yeah, I did notice that. You know, I noticed that even when I was doing my homework, I was like more excited to get through it and everything. I said, that's right. That's power, right? So maintaining ourselves, giving ourselves a sense of power in life. When we're excited about something, we feel like we're on fire. We feel like we're indomitable. We have confidence. We can do stuff. It turns into results. So with that preface, question I have for you, Lance, is, you know, in those early days, and even now you say you're still grinding, but like, what do you, what do you use to, to charge up your power? How do you stay in power? Because we all have days when we wake up, and maybe you don't, but I have days when I wake up, Lance, where I'm just like, I'm like, oh, fuck, another day. <laughs> I'm like, do I need to do this? You know, okay, let's get out of bed. You know, other days I jump up. So how do you keep yourself really powered up for you? You have routines. Is it is it just thinking about the pain of the past? Do you yes. have some stories about where you, you just grew up it. and who you are now? Yeah, tell yeah. me. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly. I'd, I'd say number one, it's the pain of the past for yeah. sure. Yeah, it's the Michael Jordan chip effect, right? Like, I just love that. I love that. I just love that story so much. When and if, I, if people don't know what that is, the short story is he didn't make the he didn't make the varsity team. I think after his sophomore year, and then uh, that summer, then just grinded. Grinded, 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 grinded. It's all he did was basketball. And th- to, then he made the starting team his junior year. And if he wouldn't, you got to wonder, like, oh, would he, I mean, it's arg- it's almost inarguable. Would he have put in the time and the effort if he didn't have that chip on his shoulder? And I, I don't think he would have. We, like, we, like, imagine us not having Michael Jordan. Oh, man, the world would be, dude, I grew up in the 80s, man. The Wheaties, are you kidding yeah. me? I mean, at the, the Air Jordans, I mean, the world would be seriously, I mean, and... You could, it's our, it's, you could argue. You could argue. We wouldn't even have Yeezys today. We wouldn't have like Yeezys, Kanye West, yeah, whole whole apparel. I mean, the influence is just so yeah, huge. It's been, that's, huge. That's not, it's been yeah. huge. Amazing. That small, that small little friction point that he had of someone telling him he wasn't good enough. He was never going to make it. I heard someone told me just yesterday, actually, but we we're talking about the same thing. Someone told Ronaldo, the famous soccer player, that soccer would never feed him. Yeah. That's insane. And so <laughs> so it's a, it's a double edged sword, right? Because like uh and I I don't know I I feel like that's a it's definitely a masculine sort of thing cuz like our egos, you know, you hear the t- old trope about like a man's ego is fragile, right? And there's a tr- the truth to it is is like yeah, yeah, especially if you got for me you got laid off. Like what what re- drove me was in, in two different ways. So like in college what drove me to compete in college and then be graduate at the top of the class. So I had that kind of portfolio at the end where I could basically seal my deal to be free in the sense of getting seven interviews in Colorado and, and moving out of North Dakota. I still love North Dakota, but like for me, I was like, I need, that's where I want to live. It's where, and it's, it's frankly, it's where I could practice like really good architecture. North Dakota just doesn't have those kind of opportunities, right? And the chip from there was I was going to school with all, a bunch of these other kids who had uh, much better educations than me in, in high school and everything because they went to big, they had more opportunities. They went, they were like from Minneapolis and stuff. And I was from a town of 500 people and graduated with 19, no opportunities whatsoever. So I just had a huge chip on my shoulder in that kind of way. And then there was like, there was parents along the way too, where like that psycho kid's not going to amount to anything. Like he's just a troublemaker. Cause I was a rebel. I still am. And I, lo- I was like, yeah, 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 no, I'm going to show you guys, right? I love it. Um, and then the <laughs> the other one is when I moved to Boulder and got laid off and, after being there for nine, you know, at that first firm for nine months. And I was so mad because I knew they had no business prowess about them whatsoever. None, none. And as a matter of fact, like that, that original firm is, they even broke up and split up. It was even further proof for us. I'm like, oh my gosh, like I'm very thankful that they took a chance on me and I was, it, it helped me get here. And all of that, but at the same time, I can still, you know, be pissed about it, and have that chip on my shoulder, and that is still what drives me today, uh, with F9, 100%. As a matter of fact, I just posted. You talked about social media. I just posted on my private Facebook, um, because I don't really do anything public there anymore. And uh, but you're my friend, and you see the posts. And I just posted. I go like, we back. We just we just our finalists for the back for uh, the best of mile high award, which is the best in customer service. There was like 15 architecture firms, top ones in the state nominated. Now we're down to three and hope, well, God willing we'll win again. But the, but the caveat I added to that is I go, the most hilarious part about it is like the, it's, it's that I beat the guy who laid me off. 
Mm. I, I beat I beat that firm <laughs> yeah. in into the finalists Victory just this sweet. year, and I'm going like this is sick. Victory. And then you know, and then we talk about all the all the money we poured in our website and marketing lately. And I Google it once a day, you know, like Colorado luxury architect or residential architect or something. And we're right there, neck and neck with that guy still. Like for the first time, we're right there. So it's like you just you gotta be. And look, I I'm gonna be guilty of it just by proxy. Be careful about who you piss off. Because some of us, some of us are still burned and now we'll never stop in that kind of a way, right? <laughs> we'll crush you. <laughs> I, I want, I, so like Frank Lloyd Wright, you know, he would always put himself in these really bad financial positions on, and I almost wonder if it was yeah. on purpose. Yeah. And Sub, if that's at what, least subconsciously for sure. Don't you think? It, yeah, he's almost sure. like self-sabotage. Absolutely. In I that agree. Way. I agree. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, yeah, that's huge. I, I remember my best work at school in terms of uh, like writing papers was like when I was under the gun, when I was under the pressure, when I had to whip out a, like a research paper, an essay in like overnight, stay up all night long. And it would be like, damn, it was done. It was pretty damn good too. But it's like the, mm -hmm. and a lot of architects find this too, like the creative pressure. There's something about needing to have a deadline when it's just like, okay, we got to buckle down. We got to make this thing flow. It's crazy, but yeah, powerful. So, powerful. so what I want to leave with our listeners today is just like, you know, if, if you haven't had a really painful experience, consider that might be a handicap for you. And then, but also with a word of hope, like what can you do in your life to be able to manufacture some drive, mm. to manufacture some desire, to manufacture, because we can, right? There's things we can do every single morning. I have a morning routine to get myself in power every single day, and it's worked out marvelously, you know? And the other thing is pain is simply a perspective. So pain is a perspective compared to a pleasure. Right, so what Lance experienced as pain when he got laid off was compared to the pleasure of actually having a steady job and 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 being an architect. I went through the same process myself. So the other way that I'm going to offer to our listeners that you can get some some additional drive and motivation, some power in your life is by shifting your perspective, shifting your perspective. So just as a quick note on that, when I was a kid, I had a bit of chip on my shoulder. I was kind of an angry kid. My mom was kind of controlling. And so she sent me to um, a psychiatrist. Now I thought I was all broken. I'm like, oh, man, I'm going to a psychiatrist. Had emotional problems and issues. I met with him for about six months. And he's like, you know what I think would be really good for you, Enoch, is um, for you to join my boys group. I'm like, okay, cool. So I joined his boys group. And in the boys group, I discovered that these kids didn't have fathers. Their mothers would come home drunk or high. You know, sometimes they would be out all night because they're on the street. And that 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 um that turned me around right away. I went back to my home and I was like the most grateful kid ever because I'm like, wait a second, I have this amazing family, I have a roof over my head, I have a bed. So there's an element here of giving ourselves the perspective that can really drive and increase our performance and give us power. And that can that's what can help you do the grind. But don't let the grind overtake you because there are it's easy to let our relationships and other parts of our life suffer, including our fitness relationship with ourselves with the higher power when we're just focused on work so there's this beautiful marrying that needs to happen that we all have to walk which is the grind plus the tools the frameworks the systems and the good news is there's answers out there we live in the most prosperous time ever and I want to thank Lance for coming on the show today. Lance, thank you. And congratulations for the way you guys are crushing it, man. I mean, being awarded, getting those awards, amazing, awesome recognition for you, for your team, and especially for just being open and sharing your journey. Because like, as you were talking about do your first project, I was like, I was like a chicken coop. You could start with a chicken coop. Yeah, Al designed one. Yeah, that's why he came <laughs> to sure. mind. I was in like, his own house. You go back to one of my first episodes with you guys. I remember back in the day, it was like, I'm going to design this chicken coop. It was awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for having me on. It's always a pleasure. And that's a wrap. Oh yeah. One more thing. If you haven't already, head on over to iTunes and leave a review. We'd love to read your name out here on the show. If you've ever been frustrated that you can't find the product data that you're looking for, you might be using the wrong search engine. Broad searches result in consumer products, out-of-date information, and websites that oftentimes may hide or not have the information that you need at your fingertips. If you need specifications, CAD, BIM, etc. RCAT.com is your search engine. Find and download the up-to-date product data you need fast. RCAT.com is free, requires no registration. So go ahead, try it today. That's RCAT, A-R-C-A-T.com.
The views expressed on the show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.